Today, let's talk about the Sikta, a fascinating movement from Tchaikovsky's children's album, which looks easy on paper and sounds easy, but requires a great deal of skill and sophistication to pull off. The problem, of course, is its three-voice texture. We have the bass notes, the soprano notes, and the notes in between, like a three-layer cake. Unfortunately, what one hears at a lesson very often is this. Do you see the problem? Not only did I not hold the notes for their full value, but worse than that, I made all three voices sound like part of one melodic line within a measure. Sort of mushed them all together. It is as if we had three people in the room who suddenly morphed into one. This is not good and it does not fulfill what Tchaikovsky is asking for. So we need to work on figuring out how to make the three voices completely distinct. The first important matter is of course simply holding the notes for its full value. If you look at the math in each measure, all the voices finish at the exact same time, at the end of the measure. Something like this. Etc. Now, as you will see in a moment, there are quite a few variations to this that we can do. The next item to consider is that each one of these voices needs to have a distinct personality a distinct sound, articulation, touch, dynamic, etc. This is extremely difficult to do and requires a young and inexperienced performer to keep track of three independent lines. This is a lot like learning Bach a three-voice symphonias for the first time. Of course, in the Bach symphonias, each of the voices does approximately the same thing. Here they do things that are quite different. So let's go over each one in turn. Let's start with the bass voice. Luckily for us, the bass voice sits in what is the most beautiful register on a modern piano, the cello register. All you need to do to create beautiful sound is to sink deeply and slowly into the key. Imagine you're playing the cello. Now let's talk about the middle voice, which is sometimes in the left and sometimes in the right on the off beats. All we really want from these notes is for them to be quiet. If you have watched my earlier videos in this cycle, then you know my foremost recommendation for playing quietly is to do so from the very surface of the key. If you play from the air, one of two bad things might happen. First of all, the notes might thump out of control. You know. Even worse than that, the double notes might not sound simultaneous. They might, you know, quack. This will just compound the unattractiveness here. So touch the key and then press it gently. The most interesting voice here, at least in the beginning, is the soprano. Notice how the quarter notes have tenuta markings on them. Do not make a mistake of thinking that the tenuta marking is some kind of an accent. It is not. It is a marking that tells you to hold the note for its full value. In addition, particular to Tchaikovsky, a tenuta marking often means to move your wrist or to cushion with your wrist. Something like this. Especially with pedal, the sound acquires an incredibly beautiful cantabile, singing quality. Listen to how it differently the note sounds if you play it without the wrist movement. Do 
you hear how the decay of the note is quite sudden this way and it just falls off and it does not sing. This is not difficult to do, but it does need to be practiced. So now that we have established a different sound for each of the three voices, now we have to give each one of them life. So the first question for us is, which voice is the melody? It is a fascinating question because it doesn't have a simple answer. Tchaikovsky gives us no guidance, right? Which means it's his invitation to us to use our imagination. In fact, it is my very strong opinion that for Tchaikovsky, teaching the student to use their imagination is one of his main goals in writing the children's album. So here, Sometimes the melody might be in the left hand, and sometimes it might be in the right. And we have a repeat sign, which means perhaps it's different both times. So let's try the melody in the bass. Did you notice that I made the bass notes legato to make them sound more melodic? This is optional, but not difficult to do. I believe with a little thought in the fingering, even the smallest hand can do it. So now, let's try to put the melody in the right hand. Since I'm emphasizing the right hand, I stopped doing a legato in the left hand. In fact, what I did is I prolonged the right hand notes to make them last just slightly, slightly longer, in fact, over the bar line, but just a nanosecond, so that somehow the ear remembers the previous note even during the rest. Once you decide which voice is in charge in which phrase, then you can go on to the next step and decide on dynamics and phrasing. Again, um, there are some written dynamics in the score, but they differ from edition to edition and I think can be safely um, ignored or expanded upon. Instead, you can design your interpretation depending on how you see the phrase, how you see the piece, what mood you are in, and how beautiful your sound is. It also depends a very great deal on the tempo. As a simple rule, the slower your tempo, the shorter are your units, and vice versa. So, if your tempo here is very slow, you might think that a phrase is just four measures. and you want to phrase over eight measures, okay? That means you will crescendo over the first four and diminuendo during the second four. So another option is to crescendo during the first eight measures and then to diminuendo during the second eight. here are beautiful as long as you have a plan in mind and you follow it. Of course, you can change the plan from one performance to another. Everything depends on your piano, your acoustics, your mood, the weather outside, and so on. 
Imagination is always the queen. I hope I've answered a lot of your questions. If you have more, please leave them in the comments. Happy practicing!